There are those who would rather stand alone in the truth than live their life in deception. Tonight's guest made that choice. Stay tuned for Polygamy, What Love Is This? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith. All of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free, but I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me, and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, Polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. This is Polygamy, What Love Is This? And I am your host, Doris Hansen. We want to thank you for spending part of your Thursday evening with us. We're here on Thursday nights to talk about polygamy. I'd also like to mention right now that to the very day, even to the hour, this is a complete seven full years of broadcasting on TV20 about a subject, which is polygamy, that was never before allowed to be spoken about. In fact, growing up in polygamy groups, we were threatened with our very eternity not to speak about what went on in polygamy groups. But God has given us seven full years to be able to speak openly about some of these deep, dark secrets that go on in polygamy groups. We also want to remind you that June 25th will be our final live television show on TV20. July 1st, the station will be will have new owners and it will have all new programming. And as the final day draws closer, we anticipate what God has in store for our future, but we will miss our Thursday night live shows and our interaction with our live audience who comes here and our emails and also our telephone callers. You will be able to continue to watch our show on the internet. And of course, if you have Wi-Fi, you'll be able to connect to your television and and we'll be able to continue to watch our new show every week as you've always done. Also on our internet page where you can watch individual shows even now, there is a place for viewers comments. You can make comments or ask questions about each show and we will continue to respond to them on our future programs. So questions and answers will continue to be part of our format. Of course you can still email us like you have done in the past and if it's a person and email, we will read that on the air as well. You can go to our website, whatloveisthis.tv, for full technical information to help you with the transition. A full listing of all our past shows are also on that website, and all of our future shows, as they are posted, um, will be on that website weekly, so you can still watch our new shows when they come. Also, if you or someone you know is from a polygamy group, or if you have a particular expertise or information about Mormon polygamy, we would love to talk with you about possibly being a future guest on one of our shows. Please call if if that fits you and leave your contact information and your name, or you can email me, doris at aboutpolygamy.com, and I would love to talk to you about a future possibility. On August 14th of 2014, show number 729, we had as our guests Pastor Mike and Rosa Abate, who minister with Calvary LeBaron in the Mexico 
community of the LeBaron Polygamy Group. We talked at length with them on the show about the work that they're doing uh, among the polygamists in that Mexico community. They had contacted us several months, even a little over a year earlier, asking if we could help a young mother of three children who may possibly want to leave the LeBaron polygamist environment. Of course, we're always more than eager to do that very thing. In fact, that is the primary purpose of our ministry. Well, details and financial concerns and logistics and travel plans and, and all those things had to be worked out. And within a fair, very few days they were. And we had the family transported to Utah and under our ministry care. Transitioning from one culture to another can be difficult. Transitioning from one country to another can also be challenging, to put it mildly. A young mother transitioning from one country, country to another, from one culture to another, and on top of that from polygamy, and even on top of that with three children, well, that is a daunting task. But this wasn't the first time that we tackled this challenge, and it wasn't the last time either. And with God's help and a massive pouring out of His grace and resources, it was accomplished. Since our live television programs are numbered, we only have two more after tonight. We wanted to devote one of our final shows to the story of this young mother, hoping it may encourage our donors and those who pray for our ministry, but also that it might stop the hecklers who have accused us of never having helped anyone. But most of all, we want to, to encourage those who are watching the show who would like to leave polygamy and haven't had the opportunity or the courage or they're afraid to do so. And so to get on with the show tonight, I want to introduce and welcome the young woman I just spoke about, our very special guest, Carissa LeBaron. Thank you for coming, Carissa. Thank you. Thanks for being here and being willing to share your story. It's your story and you have one to tell. And so I think that it's very appropriate to let our viewers know what happened with you, where you come from and, and, and what you've happened since you've been here. Now it was January of 213 that you left the LeBaron community in Mexico and accepted our offer of help to come up here. It's been two and a half years so I guess the first thing I'd like to ask you and during that period of time, have you and your children found the happiness, the contentment? Had you, have you found what you hoped to find by coming up here? Well, I've found contentment. Um, I wouldn't consider uh, put contentment and happiness together uh -huh. because we still all go through this, these hard times and we have ups and downs and I define happiness as cheerful and untroubled. Mm -hmm. We still have troubles in mm -hmm. this life. We always will. Um, even Jesus said himself in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives you, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Mm -hmm. But this verse always speaks out to me because he wants us to not be... Um, troubled and stuff, but we still have troubles in this we life and we have to troubles. constantly give them to him. In fact, he promised, he says, in this world you'll have trouble, but we do have that. So you have this peace is what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so in, these, in this peace there's contentment and um, even though you have these troubles constantly, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know he's there for you. Okay, great. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about being being born and raised in being part of the LeBaron polygamous in Mexico. Tell us what it was like to be part of the LeBaron family growing up in, in the LeBaron religion. And were your parents and grandparents polygamous? Uh, my grandmother, she was a polygamist, um, Gayla Stubbs. They, her real name, uh, at least in my understanding, was Gay Stubbs. But they had changed it to Gayla. Uh -huh. um, she was a polygamist, and so is my mother. Um, I mean, I really don't know where to start because it's such a long story. <laughs> well, I think probably um, just just comparing it, maybe if you ca if you have a point of reference, what it was like growing up there as opposed to a normal f uh, community that wouldn't be polygamous. Is it, was there was there a lot of difference in in the, that kind of a comparison? 
now that I'm here, I realize that there was a lot of difference. Um, at the time, I would have never known. You wouldn't have known that. Uh, I never knew any other life. I mean, the only life that I knew outside of there was being with other people uh, out here in the United States because my mother had traveled so much. I mean, our families travel a lot and mm -hmm. doing their construction work and um, we just moved a lot and we really never paid attention to what what was going on around us because at least in, I wasn't, you mm -hmm. know. So you didn't have a lot of interaction with non-polygamists so that you would have a comparison? Basically, we, we, we were so consumed in what we had to do, uh, our responsibilities and um, taking care of our family, um, we kind of kept to ourselves. Yeah. Would, would you say that, uh, and I've talked to polygamists from all the groups and my own experience as well, um, but would you say, some, some people have, say they have a happy childhood, that, that like the FLDS, a lot of them say, oh, I loved it when I was a kid, it was when I grew up that it got horrible, uh, because they had the freedom to roam and to hike and to do all these things. Others, they had a lot of abuse and a lot of, of, um, of negative things going on in their life as a child. What would you say your childhood was like? I'd say mine is between. Um, <laughs> There was times we got to do things, but my mom, I was the oldest, so growing up, my responsibility was helping take care of families. Since my mom had divorced once mm -hmm. and left the community, left my father, um, I felt a lot of responsibility on me for my family, mm -hmm. um, for my brothers and sisters. And that happens a lot in polygamy, I think, especially the oldest girl. A lot of responsibility is put upon her. I know that. I was the oldest girl, too, and a lot was put on me. Okay, now Joel LeBaron was the prophet of the LeBaron polygamy group when it first started down there. Um, is he related to you in any way? Joel LeBaron is my grand, great, oh, not, I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> my great uncle. Your, Joel LeBaron's your great uncle. Yes. Okay. So he was the prophet, the originating prophet actually, when it first started. Um, w w do they have a prophet now? now? He's killed and he's gone? Did, did they appoint a prophet in his place? Not that I know of, at least in my understanding. Um, they had given authority to certain people. Um, some of my uncles, and well they're all great uncles to me, all the brothers. Mm -hmm. um, that's the last that I knew of or heard of, at least that my family had talked about to me. Are they looking for a prophet? Do they think they need to have one? or they just Well, in my understanding, what I was told, Joel F. LeBaron, the prophet at the time, was predicted that there would be a new prophet rising uh, to take the keys and stuff, mm -hmm. and that prophet still hasn't come. Still so hasn't rose, rose up, and, but they're doing fine without a prophet, huh? And they I seem guess. to be yeah. doing pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it seems, at least in my perspective, it seems better run where there's not too much control and stuff. Um, Actually, I would have to agree with you. Carissa, how old were you when you left the, the community and how old were your children? Do you want me to answer the left from Mexico or from... When you came up here to, here? to us? Uh -huh. uh, I was tw 20... I'm not really sure on this. How old are you now? I'm <laughs> 24. <laughs> so you would have been 20, just barely 20, 21, 21, 22, right? Yes. And you had three little girl, three little kids. My kids were one, barely one, one barely turned one that year in January. One, two, and three. The mm -hmm. other one just turned four in May, but we came, we came around like November of the year before that, and he turned one in January, so he wasn't even one years old yet. Yeah, yeah. So they were very young kids. Yes. Very young kids. When you decided to leave and the children's father found out that you were going to leave, how did he respond to your decision to go? Did he try to keep you? Did he, did he even do anything to try to keep you from coming up here? Um, not really. Nobody knew what was going on. Um, really? I had made the decision just abruptly, yeah. quickly. Uh, I didn't even know what's happening at the time. Um, I just decided to do it. I mean, I thought I was coming out here to just get away from everything and think of what I could do and what decisions I could make. Kind of like a, 
vacation time, if you want to put kind it that a way. Place to stop and think for yes. a minute, and then go back to your other life. So, so what what decide what happened to make you decide to do this to take this step? That's a pretty big step. To tell you the honest truth, um, I really didn't know why I decided at the time. I was just I felt tired and emotionally drained and. Um, most of the time, my only agreement to that would be that because I left was trying to stand up what I thought was right. So I had left my husband at the time and um, was just trying to live up to what I was taught because mm -hmm. I believed that he wasn't doing it the way my grandmother had even trained us, t uh, told us, and showed us. and. Mm -hmm. um, so you wanted to live up to the teachings, you didn't think he was, and so you just kind of want a little time away to, to think about things. To see if it was, if I was even being true to what um, mm -hmm. I was even taught. Okay. So you asked Mike and Rosa at, at Calvary LeBaron for help, and of course they offered to help you and they contacted us and supported your decision. There must have been some difficulty. Um, in your in your leaving in your preparation to leave and in your your difficult time in making the decision what what now we know now why you made the choice but what, what was the most difficult part of choosing to leave is it leaving your family behind are you afraid that you would lose what you had or, or that you would be outside of God's will or what I mean I really didn't ask Mike and Rosa for help they actually offered I mean it happened in a strange way of, it seemed like they were the only people I could trust at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why I could trust them. There was something about them that I feel like I've known them all my life. Yeah. Um, but the most difficult part about making that decision was that I, had a, I was leaving my husband. Um, I was still very in love with the man, mm -hmm. at least in my understanding. and. Um, these were the father of my children, and I never saw myself as being divorced, ever. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason I had stepped my foot down was um, I'd, I'd seen what was going on, and I didn't like it, and it wasn't what I believed that we should be doing, you know. And was that him seeking another wife? Yes. Yeah, and that's a hard part. It's a hard part for polygamy, isn't it? I know just one of the hard parts, but a very difficult part for the woman is to see her husband looking for another one. And, and all that goes with it. It's a long trip that you made from Mexico to Salt Lake City. And you drove part of the way with them and then you got on the plane and you flew the rest of the way. Um, what went through your mind? Were you, were you looking forward to the adventure or were you scared? Were you afraid of what was happening? What was gonna happen? I believe my mind was so wrapped around um, what I was gonna do because I still was thinking about what can I do where can I go work? I could go with my brothers, you know. I was just wanting to know what to do with my life because, I mean, if I had to step my foot down now, told Johnny this was it, um, my ex-husband, mm -hmm. uh, he, I, it just was devastating to me. I really didn't think about what was going to happen here. Yeah. Uh, this I was feel just like a stopping point for you. I was numb. Yeah. I was emotionally numb. drained and numb and. I mean, I just felt like there was a barrier around me that just, mm. I could care less what happened. Mm. Interesting. Most communities, polygamous communities, have the implanted their members with patriarchal authority. Now, I don't, since you didn't have a prophet, I wondered if you had that fear in you. Was there, patriarchal meaning the men or the leader, they make the decisions, they make all your choices, the women don't really have much say in it. Did you have that down there? I probably did have that a little bit with my own birth father. Um, I mean, I wasn't around him too much to realize that was going on because I don't remember hardly enough of my childhood. Did you fear any patriarchal authority? Was there mm. any fear in your mind over By the time I was born and um, things started changing drastically in my age, uh -huh. um, because there was no prophet, he had died before I was born. Yeah. And I don't think I was really afraid of any of any of that because we traveled so much and we're going out in the United States back and forth. Um, we really didn't have that example around us. 
So the community uh, the, that you grew up in, was it just um, a regular community then? I mean, uh, I think uh, most people think of polygamy groups as, as like Colorado City, where everything is run by the polygamist uh, hierarchy and and uh, you have, you're under their thumb and under your control. Yours wasn't like that then. No, um, Joel, the prophet at the time, was always taught um, that people were allowed to have their freedom to choose. Uh, they would always let them see what was going on and what they believed and teach what they taught mm -hmm. and would let people come in and be baptized when they they believed that was right, you know. So they always had a freedom and they always mingled with the people that were outside of what they believed. Um, they always had a heart for the Mexicans mm -hmm. down there, mm -hmm. uh, loved them dearly. Uh, to me, it was as free as it ever was until we had other people come in trying to take authority and stuff and oh. demand something otherwise. Yeah, interest, that's interesting. Okay, so you arrived at the Salt Lake Airport and we met you at the, I remember that day very clearly, I'm sure you do too, and never met you before in my life. You had just three little kids and we rushed you to the car and put the kids in the car seat. You got in the car and you were whisked off with a brand new home with complete stranger absolutely didn't know the person before that day so going back to that day in your mind what were you thinking were you sitting there in the car wondering what have i done where am i at and what am i doing <laughs> honestly i never thought of any of that i mean when i saw S suzanne case uh she was a darling um she started asking me questions For some reason i just felt so free with her mm. i mean I wasn't afraid to tell her anything. Mm. Um, it's like I'd known her. Yeah. I don't know how to tell you that, but I'd, I'd known her, but I'd never seen her in my life. Mm. And she, she asked me this question about what life is down there and what, what we believed. And I started telling her things. And, I'm, I, and I remember telling her that never in my life have I not felt so free about telling somebody that we live polygamy because in our life we were taught not to tell people because yeah. we were f I was always in fear that somebody was going to come get my mother or come get my yeah. father and throw them in jail or something you know that I grew up as a child fearing that that's exactly the way we were raised yeah but you were free felt free to talk to her that's great. That's that's that's. She's a wonderful lady. The the couple that you were with were wonderful. I have three questions now. I want to ask you. Tell us how you and the kids were received by this new family that you had. Were your fears increased, or they were they put to rest? Any fears that you had in making this transition, and were you overwhelmed and scared? Did you want to go back, or did you want to stay where you were? Did you did you feel that comfortable with them? After three months of being. Um there and in their place in Suzanne Russell's place I um, was just in lost in thoughts of what I could do and then when reality really hit me that I was here I didn't wasn't sure what to do and I started calling I called my brother actually um, Alan LeBaron he begging him for help wanting to get out um, starting to doubt that I'd made the wrong decision because I don't know what I was doing here. I mean, I, I didn't know why I was gonna get help. I, I realized even if I don't go back to my husband, if I go, but I have to go back to my family, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I couldn't live without living in Mexico. Yeah. Um, that's all I've known. And even though my mother has probably did other things outside of Mexico, I was always, all I knew was children. That was your home point. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Children raising them and feeding them. And um, yeah. I was so in fear to even go find a job, realizing if what if I have to go find a job and I end up staying here? Uh, maybe I should just go work with my family and and work with my so brother that, on construction. So that's when the transition really started, when, was when you started thinking of your future and what was going to happen. Yes. Then. When you had only been here a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, and you asked me a question, a question I had never been asked before in my life. But it didn't surprise me. <laughs> the question didn't surprise me in the least because you're from a polygamy group. But the question was, where in the Bible does it say when a woman can sta stop having children? 
And of course, I told you it doesn't say that in the Bible because God doesn't regulate or command a woman have certain kids, amount of kids to a certain age or anything like that. But you asked the question in response to something you had been taught. And what was that? Well, we were taught um, that there was a pre-existence of life, spiritual babies. Well, not babies, but spiritual people. Mm -hmm. And that we had to have children, bring them on this earth so they could gain a form of body mm -hmm. so they can grow up and do the teachings that we were taught so they can make it to the higher kingdom where they talk about the terrestrial, the celestial, and the terrestrial kingdoms. Mm -hmm. um, and in other words, to be able to make it to the highest one, you have to uh, bring children into the world and make, make your family grow so you can grow your kingdom when you die. Yeah. So yeah. Um, having many children is not exactly a requirement, but it's the greatest work to grow your whole community and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, these spiritual babies are so desperate for bodies because they want to come down and they're anxious to get here to to be able to make their kingdoms that we that is our greatest work as women to bring these children into this world and so you thought that you would be required to have children and continue to have children until you couldn't have children any longer or, yes or? i mean i kind of see that with my mother now she's still having a lot of children she's has 11 she just had another one. Oh my um we were so taught that we yeah. we don't realize the difference. So people and a lot of people enjoy having their children. I mean, that's a great blessing to them. That's true, but sometimes they can't um, they can't afford really to to support large families like that. Um, of course, we know that that isn't true. That there's not these uh, pre spirit babies that are waiting there for us to to give birth to them and. Um, and a woman's job is more than just having babies. Well, my family was, they always, they do believe that um, God will provide for them so they will keep having children. If they're mm -hmm. doing God's work, that they will keep being provided for and even yeah. their children. And I do, I remember growing up in life, we were always provided for. So, um, I mean, there's never a time I ever remember going hungry course we probably had the same meal over and over but <laughs> we never went hungry uh, you know that that's a good question uh, when the LeBaron for group first began in, in its, its early days um, and you can read Susan Smith books you know my favorite wife about the horrible poverty that they existed all of the LeBaron families uh, all the polygamous families it was the the poverty was absolutely terrible and both by necessity and by doctrine, almost, you know, this is that makes you a stronger person for God if you can overcome all of this and live in poverty, too. Do, do they still believe in that uh, po poverty is a blessing, or, or have they kind of got it more it's resourceful? It's not necessarily the poverty that we see in this life. They talk about more being humbling yourself in the poverty area. Um, where riches are not very great, but you can still have things and mm -hmm. care for yourself and care for your needs and have nice things as long as you're not um, running after riches, you know, mm -hmm. um, at least in my understanding growing up. And the poverty, it's not very poverty there. Um, I mean, even if we were poor, there's always the community is all, always so gathered together anybody's willing to help you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing that happens with the polygamy groups normally. Yeah. So they're out there and they will, they'll definitely, you let people know that you need help, they will help you. And family mm -hmm. members, I remember some of my uncles were always there for my mom. Mm -hmm. um, he even took me one time because she was having difficulties with me, but I remember him being a lot of influence in my life. Do they live the United Order like the other polygamy groups do? I'm really not sure to tell you that. Um, I didn't grow up in that time, so mm -hmm. since we moved so much, um, my mother was away from the community half the time. So, so she didn't give her property or her money to the community. She kept it for her own family. Well, people are free are free to give in charity whenever they want. But that's not a requirement. That's it's, the, the it's not a requirement. A requirement. They want it to come from you, and yeah. um, 
you do it out of your own doings because you want to help your family because you love them. And, and that, that's, the main, that's the way it should work rather than the forcing that the other polygamy groups do. My mom first started talking to me about polygamy when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And um, when I was 12 years old, she thought I was almost an adult. And she started, you know, making everything in my life as if I were an adult. And that included more lectures and more information about polygamy, which I certainly hated. <laughs> but, but that's when I really started learning about what polygamy was and the requirement. God required it. I'd go to hell if I didn't do it and all these other fire and brimstone things. How were you taught about polygamy? Were you taught it that way? Was it a requirement or you'd go to hell? What, how did they teach it to you? I was taught that since there was three, higher ki three kingdoms, like I told you, t lester c lester and the t mm -hmm. Um If we could live polygamy and make it to the highest one, and if we didn't live polygamy and just lived in, you guys call it a monogamy mm -hmm. marriage? Yeah. Um, if we lived in a monogamy marriage, we would only become an angel or servant to the ones that the make polygamous. it to the higher kingdom. Yeah. And um, I don't know if it was taught like that uh, before my time, before I was born. I've heard a lot of things that it wasn't, but in my time growing up, we were definitely taught that we could become angels if we wanted, and we had that mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. But um, you didn't become uh, a god of world, you didn't become a god, not exactly a god, but somebody that works next to the god of over everything, mm -hmm. and um, who makes worlds with him, and um, creates and uh, helps do his works mm -hmm. um, and share in those works but the angels were not allowed to see the gods interesting and they would only see the ones that are helping mm -hmm. they would never see the higher god ever hmm. that's very interesting the bible says that the angels see the face of god so i don't suppose that that would be quite right well you know we are now at uh, the halfway point and so we're going to open up our telephone lines so that any of our viewers who would like to call in and ask Carissa a question or make any comments, please feel free to do so. Please stay on topic. Uh, out of respect for our guests, don't call in on anything else, please, but just to ask her or make comments about what we're talking about tonight. Our telephone number is 801-973-8820, 973-TV20. And as we wait for the phone calls to come in, we do have a message to share with you. The night of my wedding was the saddest day of my life. Either you live polygamy or you're going to go to hell. And I would wish somebody would come and kidnap me and take me away. I had no idea what polygamy was actually going to be like. Dear God, help me get out. All these men did whatever they wanted to all these women in my life, and sometimes me. I was given as a third wife to a man that I'd hated since I was nine. And I couldn't do what I would think about it. I was born here, in the land of the free, a slave in a polygamous cult. And my story is not unique. Tragically, too many heartbreaking stories are never made public and they remain untold. We are talking about tens of thousands of lives held captive by this cruel system of religious polygamy. And it is a living nightmare for those who want to get out and can't. I, like other polygamous children, did not have a choice in marriage. I had my free agency to do what I was told or suffer the consequences. That's not a choice. Polygamy forces young girls into marriage because the supply of women gets depleted quickly. They are treated and considered as commodities. I married our prophet, Joel LeBaron's younger brother, Verlin, when I was just past my 15th birthday. I became his sixth wife. He was 38. If the public was educated about what really goes on in polygamy, they would realize that these women are literally in bondage. I wanted to run, I wanted to leave. And by the time I really got the courage to leave, I found out I was pregnant. 
and felt like I couldn't. And with each one that was born, I hated myself because I brought another child into slavery. I was now trapped. And uh, the bondage of my motherhood was now going to keep me there. And I would hold my baby and cry and tell her, what kind of a mommy have you got? You will be a slave all your life, just like me. And I brought you into this world. I prayed every day, dear God, help me get out. But help me get out with my children. A Shield and Refuge ministry draws its mission from Isaiah 61, to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, and to declare the Lord's favor to those who have only heard of His anger and rejection. The challenge before us is to have a safe place for refugees to go. You can't even imagine how different my life would have been if that had existed for me. But we know that God has not called us to undertake this task alone. We need help. And He's putting together a team to make this facility a reality. We are calling this safe house the Hagar Home in honor of a young, helpless girl who fled polygamy thousands of years ago and in recognition of the great God who saw her and cared for her and still sees and cares for polygamous refugees today, then they too will be able to heal and grow strong and move forward in life with hope and confidence. Together we can bring good news to those who suffer, gently calm those who live in fear, and declare freedom to those modern-day Hagars of contemporary Mormon fundamentalism. Welcome back to our show. Uh, this is Polygamy, What Love Is This? And we have been talking about um, Carissa's experience and journey and adventure from leaving the LeBaron community in Mexico to come up and start a new life with her three young children. We've uh, gotten probably about halfway through your story, uh, but we invite our viewers to call in and if you have any questions or comments, please do so. Also, we only have two more shows after tonight uh, before we will be uh, leaving TV 20. And we want to ask anyone who knows someone or if you are yourself um, have experience in a polygamy group or expertise about polygamy and you'd like to be a guest on our show, give us a call. You can uh, email uh, Doris at aboutpolygamy.com or you can call, leave your name and your contact information with the operator tonight and I'll get back in, tuck with, in touch with you. Um, we do have a couple of calls coming in right now, so we'll take them and then we'll continue on with your questions. Our first call is Karen and Bob from Brigham City are calling in. Hello, Karen. Hello, Doris, dear one, and Carissa, dear one. Hi Hello. there. <laughs> How are you? Hey, we just, we just, we just wanted to say hello to you and say how proud I am, Carissa, of, of your journey and how much it's been a privilege walking with you and your children and watching you grow in the Lord. <laughs> and it's just been a privilege. But I tell you that because we love you so much. Well, I love you too. Thank you so You're much. You're even like our own daughter. You know that. <laughs> but I know you have 15 dads. So <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Chris. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Bob and Karen. I appreciate you. I hope you're having a fun vacation. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We are. Well, stay out God of the rain. You guys. Stay out of the thunderstorms. <laughs> Talk to you later. <laughs> Goodbye. Chris, I wanted to tell you, too, how, how proud I am of the way that you have grown in the Lord and the way that you constantly share your faith with others through social media and just in talking with everyone. It is such marvel to watch and see what God's doing in you. Well, praise God. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Karen. Mm -hmm. Bye. And, and just to say, Karen uh, and Bob both uh, have volunteered here behind the scenes on this show. Karen has been doing it 
for years. Bob did it at first and, and needed to stop. And they've also helped you. They Karen helped you with your children when they first got here and, and watched them and took them in her daycare and, and a lot of the... the Karen was um, did preschool, so she helped a lot with my children during yeah. the time that... It, I really needed it. So. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're wonderful. Thanks, Bob and Karen, for calling. Okay, we have on line two, Oren from Kearns. Hello, Oren. Hi. Yes, you're on the air. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say um, how awesome and courageous I think it is that uh, Chris is uh, willing to get on and and share her story. So thank you for that. But um, my question was just because my family and I are watching and. Uh, my mom and my fiance are kind of debating on uh, the, uh, I guess, the strength of uh, the commitment to stay out of that lifestyle. Obviously, it's difficult, but um, I don't. I mean, is there? What's the pull like to uh, stay focused uh, in the polygamous lifestyle and, and continue on that way? Do you understand the question? He he wants to know if you're pulled back into the to going back into the polygamous lifestyle, or if you're strong to stay out of it. I mean, I was never pulled back at any time to go back um, until I had learned what was the truth at the time. Even when I was here for three months, um, I wasn't too sure what to believe at the time. Um, but I never was pulled back at all because. Uh, at least what I was learning, what he was, what my ex was doing, um, I didn't think I would want to go through that again, even if I had to live as an angel, you know. Yeah. I told myself I'd just live like that if I had to. Um, but the most thing now, uh, now that I'd found out that I really didn't want that in my life anymore, was all because of God, honestly. It was definitely His strength. I mean, I prayed every day. I got on my knees. I bawled. Um, and his truth, the truth that you found in the Bible that, that you knew that that wasn't the thing that you wanted to do. That's still a journey for me now. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't say that uh, condemn what people are living because, I mean, I was as blind as anybody else. And all, to me, biblically, it says that only God can open our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, when we go to him, he says that he will open our eyes and he will give us truth if you yeah. humbly come to me. Mm -hmm. And it was because I came to him in that way and humbly seeked him and wanted him with all my heart. And he says that he, that he will respond to that. Yes. So that, that's a very good answer, Chris. I hope that answered our viewer's question. We have an off the air question. Was Chris's mother a first wife? So she was able to take the name LeBaron? If you don't want to answer, that's fine. If you do, that's I'm fine. I'm kind of confused as what you... Uh, your, your last name is LeBaron, so they're wondering if your mother married, uh, was the first wife of, of a LeBaron so that you could have that name. My father was Samuel LeBaron. People call him Sam. Mm -hmm. um, then she divorced him and remarried my stepfather, Dickie LeBaron, which, well, it's Ricardo LeBaron. They call him Dickie. His nickname is Dickie. Um, so either way... Yes, I'm a LeBaron. Either way, you're a LeBaron. No. <laughs> That's the way it works in polygamy groups. Okay, Carissa, taking everything into consideration, I have three questions that I want to ask you. Are you sorry that you left? Would you do the same thing all over again if you had to or had the chance? And were you treated right when you got here? I am definitely not sorry that I left. Um, I mean, I've learned a lot. Uh, God has opened my eyes to a whole new world to me. Um, I definitely would not do it over again um, unless God called me to but I would probably I don't see how I could do my how I could let myself do it all over again because I mean I've known something so different um, that God has revealed to me and showed me that uh, there's a different life, Carissa, you know, and mm -hmm. so I would never do that again. So you wouldn't leave here, you, know, you wouldn't leave here for another, okay. And were you treated right? I definitely would say that they treated me very well, even though I went through some hard times and um, they never try to keep me from stopping from going when I decided I wanted to leave, you know, and I wanted to go with my brother and they were 
they would talk to me and ask me why and try to understand me and um, they really were there for me a lot and just literally listened to everything I had to say and um, mm -hmm. I can't even explain that honestly. Carissa, when, when you first got with us, you um, had long hair and <laughs> now your hair is short and beautiful and it was long and beautiful too but very often when uh, a woman will leave a polygamy group and she has long hair she will cut it and so I'm asking you what was it that made you decide to cut your hair did the LeBarons were they one of the groups that required the women to have long hair or was that your choice and you just decided to change your hairstyle well as I look back at the pictures that we had growing up when I was a little girl because I don't remember so much of my younger lives um, we did have long hair and we did wear different clothes than what I'm wearing now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was always required of long hair. I, I remember my father telling me that, um, you know, if we painted our nails, it was evil. And if we dyed our hair, it was not good. And, and cutting your hair short was from the, the evil one. Mm -hmm. um, and if men had long hair, he, he even told my brother one time, I remember even still then, uh, probably about eight, nine years ago that he, he was growing his hair long and he's told them that if he had long hair that he was going to go to hell for it. Not exactly hell, oh but it, God was going to curse him for that. And he's like, well, Dad, how can that be true when Moses had long hair and so did Abraham? And um, he really didn't get that, you know. And so me cutting my hair coming here, I believe it was, I can't really say, I didn't really understand it at the time. Um, until I looked over it after I had cut my hair about three months in and I realized maybe I was cutting my hair because of a rebellious thing. Um, <laughs> I just got sick and tired of my hair and everybody, hair was a feminine thing for women and beauty, you know, and um, we, they wanted them to have long hair. And even though older people have short hair because their hair is falling out, the younger ones still, it's better that they have long hair, at least in mm -hmm. my understanding growing up. And um, it was a, probably to me, as I searched my heart out as to why I did it, mm -hmm. it was something like, I'm free, I'm gonna do what I wanna now, and <laughs> you guys can't tell me that I have to have long hair and that I look pretty in long hair or that I look ugly in short hair. Yeah. So. And, and that's a freedom of choice that we all have, and God has given us freedom of choice. And you look very beautiful in okay. short hair. <laughs> you do. Honestly, you do. A lot of people when they leave polygamy groups will leave behind God. They've had it up to here with religion because God requires all of these things like long hair and lots of babies and whatever else, other thing might have been what you didn't like, mostly sharing your husband. But you didn't leave God behind when you left and that's unusual. Why didn't you leave him behind? I wouldn't known at the time then, but in my journey lately, um, people have been telling me that I just, I'm the kind of person that just grabs God, you know. Um, I didn't want to leave him because I really wanted to know who this God was. Um, and I encourage, that's what we should do because, you know, we have family around us telling us who this God is and what we should do and what's required. and. Um, now that I came out of it and saw something otherwise besides what I grew up in, it was making me question, you know, if people are living this life and, and they believe that they're saved, um, what, what makes it different if we live that way or this way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when I had left, it became something I questioned and questioned that, who are you, God, you know? Mm -hmm. I really want to know who you are because I want to find out for myself, not because my family told me this is what God t wants us to do, or not because the prophet told me this is what we wanted yeah. to do. I want to know what you want me to do, because if you are not a God in a form of body or like humans, you know, I realized that even I had made mistakes because my biggest mistake I realized was divorcing. To me, you don't get divorced, you know. Mm -hmm. You stick with your family, family is everything and yeah. you care for them and you take care of them. And I mean, I went through so much realizing that my mom had got divorced and wondered 
what had happened there and she remarried and the biggest question that questioned me that I didn't want to leave God was I wondered about my mother divorcing my father and then remarrying my stepfather. Um, in my understanding, we weren't supposed to do that when um, she's already been married. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Joseph Smith talked about um, marrying virgins and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. That never made sense in my head. And so that made me want to cling even to God even more and deeper because yeah. to me, God meant everything or this life was nothing. So people need, when they leave polygamy, would you advise them to seek God rather than throw him out? I believe that people, anybody, should seek, seek God more than anything and don't listen to what others are telling them around them. They have to Find really dig themselves. in and search the truth because the, the inf information is out there. We mm -hmm. just have to look at it because I was taught so much growing up that internet was lies, um, uh, things that people say on the news were lies, and of course maybe some news exaggerate, but there is still some truth and evidence and records mm -hmm. behind all that mm -hmm. if we actually really dig into it. Right, exactly right. Well, we've got another call here. Let's take it. Bob calling from South Jordan. Hello, Bob. You're on the air. Hi, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions, please. Uh, I wanted to know how old her husband was when she was in the polygamy, uh, and uh, I wanted to know how many other wives he had been and how many he has now, if she knows. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my husband then... Uh, he was, I don't know when, what age you want to know. When we got married, I was 17, he was 18. Um, so we were only about a year apart. He did not have other wives at the time. I was the first wife and he basically was searching for other, for wives where God had called him to remarry again when I was with him. So I was all for that because I stand for it so deeply because that was the biggest teaching in our life, and mm -hmm. um, he did date quite a bit before he decided he wanted to marry somebody else, and by the time of the fourth woman, I think I just had had it, and I wanted to see what was true or not because of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Good, good deal. That's good. Gratefully that you did that. I hope that answers your question, Bob. Someone recently made a comment with me, I was talking with him on the phone last week, and he said that when adults leave polygamous communities, they are often become adult orphans. That a safe house for fleeing polygamous in reality is an adult orphanage. <laughs> and as I look back, as we were talking, I look back on my own experiences, that's just exactly what I was. I didn't even realize it until we were asking, until we were ta having that conversation last week. That's what I was, an adult orphan with no safe place to turn. Would you have considered yourself an adult orphan and in what ways would that have been true for you and did anyone adopt you? Well, I would actually consider myself an orphan. Um, I mean, you're always looking for that fatherly figure, um, especially that you never had your father around you that much. Um, mm -hmm. I've always tried to uh, understand and cling to my stepfather. It really never seemed to happen, though I loved That's him dearly. That's so true in polygamy groups for all of us. Um, but at the time, I, didn't, I did not know that Christ, Christ adopted me. You know, I really didn't understand or, or grasp it very well. Um, but he, as time went by, I realized that Christ actually adopted me into this family and um, he was my father and he didn't just adopt me spiritually he actually adopted me physically and wholeheartedly and I realized that with the families around me they were adopting me as well and taking me into this family and I mean I just praise God for that because I knew that was him you know I knew that was him sharing this life and showing me what a fatherly figure is because growing up the way you see your father I was kind of scared of my father and mm -hmm. saw him as a person that demanded a lot and that's how I saw God. Yes. And a lot of women grow up seeing the way they see their father, they see God. That's precisely right. And since he adopted me, um, not just spiritually, but literally mm -hmm. with a family that I adore and he had just opened this whole new gate and whole new door and just showed me 
who he really is because he used this person to share his love, share his tenderness, um, show that he really did love me, that it wasn't just I yes. ask of you all these things and I ask of all this demanding stuff, that I just want a relationship with you. That's yeah, all I want. That's all he wants. And he just, he, it, it, it's, I love the, the um, comparison because a lot of the false religions that claim that we have to sacrifice for God and we have to give, give, give to God before he'll accept us. But in Christianity, the God of the Bible, he sacrificed for us. And then he's the one that gives and gives and gives. He adopts us into his family. And then he just never quits giving. That's what happened with this family. I mean, I thought... At the beginning, it was like I felt guilty because I owed something to them, you know, because they helped me with this or they helped me with that. And I started realizing it's not about me having to give to God. It's about receiving from Him wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Whatever He offers to you, you receive it. Receive it as a gift and um, just thank we Him have, for it. We have a couple of minutes left or only a couple of seconds left only, but we need to take this call. Uh, line one, Suzanne, uh, thanks for calling in. We only have about 20 seconds. Can you make it fast? I can. Hi, Teresa. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that it's so fun to see you on television. Thank and you. And we're really proud of you. And um, we just love to see what God's done in your life. And what you and were a big part of it, Suzanne. <laughs> what was that? You were a big part of it. Well, God, yes. God is the one in control of all of, it, all of it. But, and... Carissa, your cheekbones look fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. I okay, appreciate I you. your call and all you've done. Love you. <laughs> Bye. Well, that's the end of the show. Thank you so much for, you, for being here, Carissa. We didn't get all of your story, but we got most of it in, and I appreciate your sharing. And, you know, we just want to close with the remarks that God does not use force to get people into heaven. He wants us all to willingly choose Him, and He is patient with us. And the Bible refers to those who refuse God's grace as having a hard heart, and to those who strive in religious works as having and working dead works. But God continues to have patience with everyone everyone who have gone their own way because he wants no one to perish. God performs miracles in a hard heart, but he will also let the hardened heart reject him until their very last breath because God never forces anyone and he doesn't resort to guilt trips. All who come to him must come willingly. God doesn't use force, no guilt, no works, no polygamy, no marriage, no tithing, no special foods or hairstyles or clothes are required. Not even Sabbath day observance is going to make points with God, but tossing all of those things away and coming to Him in repentance and through the cross of Jesus Christ makes all the points necessary to please God. Carissa left her family behind. She left her home and all she knew and loved and she followed God's will, fully knowing that she may never get her loved ones back. But Carissa's lost nothing. She now has the assurance of eternal life. She has her children and she does have her family. And she has daily peace knowing that God is pleased with her every moment of every day through Jesus Christ. You can have that same peace and assurance if you'll let go of everything and seek God alone, allowing His grace to soften your heart. See you next time on Polygamy, What Love Is This?